Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another episode of the Corporate Cowboys podcast. I'm your host, Alex, the intern. <laughs> I like that moniker. I could be the intern to anything. Um, hope you all are enjoying the first weekend of the new year. It's still January 2020. I believe it's the, what is it, the third or the fourth today? Hmm. Sunday the 3rd, imagine. Um, this one, I, I, again, just coming back for a few words, if I can, squeeze in a little bit of time to just myself, uh, which is what this project is for. The Corporate Cowboys podcast is to give you a little bit of, I guess, <clears throat> Not insider information. This has pretty much been universal knowledge, but so many are are closed to the fact, are ignorant to the fact, have their eyes closed to what's really going on around them. I feel like speaking on it might uh, spark some inspiration, might provoke some thoughts. And so this project that I've taken on for my associates volunteered voluntold you know um it's to help me also because you know i i don't do this with i don't do this without compensation i don't do this for free though i might not see it it largely material you know i might not have deposits going into my bank account um the benefit that i derive from this is being able to work on my verbal skill my social skill my my logic my prose and um, how i can lace them together and present them in an efficient and effective manner so Rest assured that your boy's getting, what is it? Getting a return, getting paid, getting some kind of currency value from, from this duty. It's a duty. It's an obligation now. I've already committed. And I'm a consonant professional, so why wouldn't I continue? Why wouldn't I see this through? little bit of water it being Sunday many many go to church many go to uh, to temple many go to uh, to service what have you and um, I got to thinking about institutions and institutionalization <clears throat> every now and then I don't know something something pushes my mind something uh, triggers my mind for lack of a better word something promotes a train of thought something fuels it I guess causes an acceleration inside of my mind and leads me to uh leads me down a thought experiment or just a, uh, a logic experiment. I typically engage in a lot of those. I'm not so much an inventor as I am a facilitator. So if inventors take on thought experiments, myself as a facilitator, I might take on a, a logic experiment and find if a certain idea or a process is logically sound. And I suppose inventors um, do that in a sense also, whether or not their idea is, is sound, whether their um, hypothesis is, is sound, their experiment is feasible, and their end result 
valid, but um, as a as a facilitator, as a facilitator, as a corporate cowboy, I think uh, it's safe to say people that exist, people engage in both of those operations simultaneously, one heavier than the other, or both evenly. In institutionalization, to be institutionalized, um, I, I knew about the word already, the word institution. I thought I had a, a good grasp on it. Um, I was somewhat of a, of a bookworm when I was younger, so I got a lot of reading in. Um, I got a lot of reading in and using context clues from reading is how I learned a lot of my definitions. Um, we did have a dictionary in the house, but... I'm grateful that I learned to use context clues early on and not have to crack the dictionary unless it was for a word that was truly foreign to me and context clues provided no um, availing, I guess, meaning or significance to the word in relation to the context around it. Institution was one of those. And in order to understand institution, you first got to view it and how it's used. And um, when I was young, I guess the first time I really saw the word institution or understood it was, I don't remember if it was through like a brochure or through a manual, but I did see institution used in the correctional sense. So in the criminal justice sense where we're talking about uh, institution, institutionalization from folks um, going to prison and coming out and how, and, and how the infrastructure, you know, what is the, the brick edifice, the the fucking building, how that constitutes the institution. It's like walking in to this correctional institution. And that was just my understanding when I was younger when I was older, when I got older, is when I realized that there's an intangible meaning to institution. And thus, that's where the term institutionalization came from. And institution, being institutionalized or institutionalization isn't the adverb. <clears throat> it's not the adverb of you know, being inducted, <laughs> inducted into a prison, you know, being, being enrolled, getting signed up for some correctional therapy. No, no, no. It's, um, I later learned that it's a, it's a mental, it's a mental process that people undergo while they are institutionalized, while they're there. And um, it really opened my eyes and opened my mind. I believe I, I finally read that out of a textbook and um, out of a sociology textbook. Or maybe it was out of, no, yeah, it was out of, out of a sociology textbook. I don't recall uh, a novel or um, a narrative, like a manual letting me know what institutionalization meant. There might've been a documentary I might've seen that mentioned institutionalization and passing and the struggles 
to re-enter society after leaving prison, but maybe it wasn't something that I, I connected to deeply with or I, I related to on a personal level myself having never been uh, in prison. Um, though it was only after I learned what the word meant and the process folks undergo mentally when they are institutionalized, I realized that the word doesn't only apply to prisoners, doesn't only apply to ex-cons who aren't able to reintegrate into society, into, into civilized, quote unquote, society when they come out. The mannerisms they pick up when they're in prison, the, the behavioral characteristics, um, just the attitude, the awareness, certain attributes that they keep with them from their time having been locked up. And uh, it's a process that does occur with time and over time. Being inside of one institution almost exclusively, and prison is very exclusive, it's very exclusionary, um, where one goes in and doesn't come out for a certain period of time, some, some stretch, some bid, when you're doing a stint. You don't come out, folks, you don't come out for however long they're in there for, one plus years, right, if it's a felony or an, an accumulation of, of offenses up to, what, life. And if they never come out, they've been wholly institutionalized and uh, they must have never known anything else other than prison. And don't get me wrong, I feel for people who go into the system when they're young and come out when they're older and have never seen a fucking touchscreen phone. Yeah, it's fucking wild. It's wild. Um, <clears throat> but in thinking on institutions and then learning about them in school and... Um, from at a research university. I learned there are, there's more than just the uh, prison institution. There's more than just the institution of criminal justice. There's the institution of the family. There's the institution of marriage. There's the institution of education. There's the institution of of many other facets to life. Some aren't coming to mind right now. Yeah, there's the institution of work, obviously. <laughs> it's like I'm keeping corporate for last because I want to build. But yeah, the build up was pretty shitacular. So I'll have to work on that. And again, that's what this whole project is about, is building on my, my social skills. But um, I, I didn't mention the institution of the church. And it's just, that could be different from the institution of religion. So institutions uh, can be distinct from one another on just the smallest of differences, the smallest, the smallest of distinctions. They could be distinguished from one another. And uh, there is some, you'll find some intersectional play there, some interaction between one and another or multiple. And yeah, having been a sociology major in undergrad, in my undergrad studies, I became accustomed and became familiar with those terms and, and do find myself using them out <laughs> out here I think some of y'all might already know what I'm getting at 
I do find them using, I do find myself using them outside of school, which is again an institution. So having re-entered education something like six years ago, that's when my bid started. And I did something like a six year stretch in school. Now you might think, damn, you're fucking slow. But no, I mean I've I've taken I've taken my time to get um to get acclimated. I already knew what I was looking for in school before I actually I already knew what I wanted out of school and then when I chose a path for after uh, I got out is when I chose my major and then based off of that I continued my studies did the four years required to fulfill the major and graduate with the undergraduate degree my bachelor's but that's still four years of uh, four solid years of higher education And some would call that quite the stretch. Now that I'm continuing education after, the fucking stretch continues. (laughs) It's going to be four plus. Four years plus. It's another stretch of time. And I do recognize that I've been institutionalized from my time at university. My thought process has changed how I interact with people if I thought I was good if I had good social skills when I was younger if I thought myself a hustler when I was younger now that I'm older I'm just less intimidated to get things started so more so of a hustler hence my use of the term facilitator I'm just facilitating (laughs) being a professional baby corporate cowboy shit and sorry before um before school i i never realized that i was institutionalized (laughs) how fucked up is that so yeah, I was still running with that with that feeling of um <clears throat> I, I I don't know. With that no, I do know. Let me put it into words. I was running around with that feeling of um preconceived uh free will, I suppose. With that feeling of free will. And I was grappling with the idea. I I was already grappling whether I knew or not. I was grappling with the idea of free will and in relation to institutions. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't conceive of myself as having been institutionalized since I was young. And... Yeah, having been born in the United States, having been born into corporate America, I was born into an institution. And those who might claim that no social contract exists, because to form part of an institution means being inducted into a way of life, essentially into uh yeah into a certain walk of life where you must walk that path and you must walk so in a certain manner you must interact with one another in a certain manner be able to express yourself in a reasonable fashion and thankfully in this institution of the United States, in this institution of liberty, we have the reasonable person standard 
So, so long as you can rationalize and the logic is sound, so your actions aren't irrational and illogical, you might have an argument for reasonableness and not have to be a lawyer about it, not have to be a lawyer to get it. But we all were institutionalized to some extent. Like I said, the institution of the family, you learned what was the family norm. And I'm not going to say I had the best, but I definitely did not have the worst. Some out there had hardly any structure, hardly had an institution in, in which to develop, in which to grow. And yeah, my heart goes out, but it doesn't mean that you needed a family in order to grow well. There is a certain, there's a certain respect that, that goes with just being alive, I guess. And people kill out of respect for respect and respecting life and respecting death. Those are also institutions, I suppose, but I won't get too esoteric about this. I'm not gonna get too esoteric about this podcast, though this is exactly what it's for. It's to speak on taboo topics. I just wanna touch on the basics, on the fundamentals, and maybe do a little light digging before uh, we get to know each other and then we could take long walks together (laughs) again i'm just getting comfortable this is what the seventh and the seventh is a good number the seventh is a good number but we're still just getting to know each other there's the institution of love and the institution of hate also but you know there's There's common practices in each. There's professional practices in each. There's a policy in each. And, uh, yeah, there's, like any other institution, disconnects exist between the policy and the practice. Again, that might be for another episode. But I'm speaking on institutionalization from when we are young to when we are older. And as a young person, recently graduated from high school, high school didn't teach me shit. Honestly, I I mean, don't get me wrong. I went to high school because I had my friends then. Uh, Some of them uh, who have... So some of them, like all of us, we've either lost, seen grow successful, or, um, or the third option. And uh, the institution of high school really empowered me. It it didn't it didn't empower me to become um, a productive citizen, a, a productive individual, a stand up individual, because I'd grow to I go on to cash and cases later on. But while in high school, I was able to develop myself, and uh, I was able to develop my skills as a young hustler and it wasn't so much to you know to do illicit illicit activities it wasn't so much to conduct illicit activity but more so to just be in in everyone's good graces and at the time I, I feel like I was successful enough to not have to uh, spread myself thin and a lot of that goes back to I guess not being fake. You just gotta... You just gotta be yourself. Because if you tried to please everybody... Again, not everybody was like my best friend. I wasn't friends with everybody. But I was cool. I, you know... Some folks owed me favors. I owed other folks favor. But I did try to hustle in a way where... I owed fewer people than folks who owed me 
And again, this isn't like a oh like like this isn't an, a a debt like one that's accounted. I had very few of those, very few and far in between. It's just more so gestures. It's more so gestures. And in institutions, gestures go a long way. Why? Because the institutions inside of different, the gestures, the same gesture inside of different institutions carries different meanings. We'll put it that way. But knowing how to navigate within and out of institutions and knowing the significance of certain gestures, certain norms or mores, ways of interacting with those institutionalized is currency. It validates it validates a person as a hustler it validates a person as a facilitator you're it you're you can be accepted as part of the institution your motives aren't questioned your intent is is trustworthy and i felt I felt like I always moved righteously, even though some of the shit I did was likely illegal. Again, if we touch on that, some of the some of what's right might be made illegal. Some of what's wrong might be made legal. As it goes historically. (laughs) But after high school is when I really saw that impact because I feel like high school is a incubation bubble for, for what many will become in their adult life. And, um, that definitely was the case for me. Definitely. Because though I was a decent student in high school, I wasn't a spectacular student because I didn't put forth that effort into being a student. I was more so hustling. (laughs) And in some instances, being the class clown. And definitely, I, I reap what I sowed there. What I reaped was, I don't know, jokes and obnoxiousness what I sowed was what I reaped was laughter and hilarity and for a while I I lived off of that because I don't know some deficiency when I was younger I needed the attention I needed to I needed to be known I needed to uh get my opinion out there I needed to get my perspective out there and find if it was funny I needed to know if people saw the things if people saw things the way I did and when they laughed yeah there was some there was some validation there and it definitely stoked stoked my inspiration it didn't fuel my ego I don't think I had a a large ego. There were some. I mean, because I was never a... I don't know. I wasn't ever a popular kid. I might have been known to many. Some for the right reasons, some for the wrong reasons. But I was never popular. And... <clears throat> but, um... But I was cool. I was... I was... Okay with most every group having graduated from high school i realized that my time in high school just made me um just made me function better with folks from all walks of life and um even and you can see this after you graduate high school when you go to community college or when you get your first job, if you ever check social media and find what your high school mates are doing, 
some of them will be complaining. Like maybe the the unpopular ones will be complaining about how unpopular they might be at work or the popular ones soaking in ego might be complaining about some egotastical bullshit. And then those who just like to whine and gripe will just be like, man, working at this fucking radio shack, RIP, working at this fucking radio shack, feels like I'm back in high school with the fucking drama. (laughs) Well, out here, you know, we call that office politics, but, um, and it's a lot more serious than high school drama, a lot more serious than student body government. Though, again, if you were part of student body government, you might know now how to, um, how to relate to certain demographics and not just the ones that, that the mainstream loves the chase, the, the age, the sex, the race. Nah, nah. When you're in politics, when you're in government, you learn to, um, what is it? You learn you learn to segmentize segmentalize. You learn to segment the population into demographics and then you're able to target certain demographics based on their characteristics on a holistic view of their traits as consumers, as constituents, as constitutionalists, you know, whatever it is that you're governing with. Um, Myself, I was able to graduate high school and went to community college for a little bit before I caught some cases, left, picked up full-time work. I mean, I was always working, but jumped into work, not only full-time, picked up a second job, and it was at this job, it was, it was at work when I met my first, uh, well, I didn't meet my first, but I worked with, knowingly, openly, damn near hired the kid. Worked with the uh, ex-con. And um, they were young when I first met him. Shit, we were all young. This was something like 10 years ago now. Over 10 years ago. And they were uh, affiliated. They were part of a gang. I won't say which one because I've got many, many on all sides. <laughs> Again, I'm not, I'm not popular. I'm not well known. I'm just cool with everybody. And being a facilitator, I do what I can to try to be in folks' as good graces and not owe anyone. Because fuck being indebted. Fuck being indebted. What is it? Fuck being in debt? Fuck. Well, I guess it goes... I I guess however I misspoke that or missaid that, mispronounced it. Fuck being indicted and fuck owing anybody. (laughs) (laughs) But that's why I never joined a gang. (laughs) Um, This kid I met and we worked with, we became cool a lot later on he was uh, already part of a gang he told me he wasn't shy about it um very very proud and working in the bay area there were uh, i'm not gonna say there were few of his homies in the area few of his boys few of his of his home boys i'm not gonna say that there was few of his members in uh, in the area but in the exact spot we were at, there were decidedly few. Decidedly. And um, it was a struggle for the kid. But working together, he would show up to work every day. And I don't know if it was... Um, he had to be... I, I'm not sure if it was a condition to some previous probation or the kid really loved work. But damn, the kid really loved work, man. Let me tell you. I know when folks are get off of probation or on parole, they need to have some sort of, um, geez, what's the term called? What's the term called? Um, the term.
term for when you get out of prison. Uh, legal, legal income. I, I guess you need to have clean, clean money coming in. Some sort of, um, geez, what's the freaking term called? And I, I only learned about this term even like after I met this guy. And we did work together. What's it called? Uh, lawful employment? Something like that. Legal employment. Lawful employment. <clears throat> I'm forgetting now. I'll look it up. But I might not be going into criminal law, so I'll look it up later. And uh, while we were while we were there, um, he was uh, decidedly more happy-go-lucky, right? I mean, he was younger. He um, a little bit more vibrant, a little bit more resilient. I mean, the kid's just resilient as fuck, right? But he was a little bit more uh, cheery, cheery, cheerful before getting locked up. Um, but yeah, while while he was there, if if he ever hears this, he he'll know exactly who I am and why I'm talking about him, and it's because we became friends ultimately. If he ever hears me up, if he ever if he ever sees this and hits me up, I'll, I'd be excited to talk to him, though it's been a couple of years since he's been down. But um, um, I I never I never judged him for the fact that he was part of a, a crew, part of a gang. There were some there who might have looked at him sideways, but I was. I don't know if I was authoritative enough that there was always I was able to <clears throat> keep a, a respectful workplace. And I'm by no definition am I big or am I intimidating? But again, being respectful, being a facilitator, you know, I guess I can't. I guess it would be wrong to use hustler in this sense. But I mean, I was hustling for myself, obviously living in the Bay cost of living through the roof i'm barely making ends meet <clears throat> so i'm hustling for myself to stay alive i'm not hustling for a gang right so i suppose i could use hustling but um i did what i could to to keep the peace or to keep whatever peace should be in a professional work environment i had always had a good work ethic coming up <clears throat> And I wasn't afraid to get my hands dirty. I, I wasn't afraid to uh, take on menial tasks. Um, to me, you know, if it if it takes more time, you know, that's cool or whatever. I mean, a job is a job. A job is a job, right? Uh, unless unless my ethics are jeopardized, a job is a job, and orders are orders, duties are duties, until ethics are compromised. <laughs> Then, then, <clears throat> then plot thickens, and soup tastes like gravy. In in, in working with him, in working with him, I I saw him go through a, a variety of changes. This kid, and um, on one such occasion, he was uh, he 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 was a he was a fighter. He was a fighter, definitely. He. I'm not gonna say he enjoyed it. More so, the gang life um, Im implied that he had to fight. The gang life brought on with it that territory that he had. He had to fight for. Otherwise, he was a a sucker, right? And I I did see this in him while we were at work, and I I tried to hone it to the best of my ability by just treating him like a, a a normal person trying to develop him as a worker for the organization as an employee as his manager as my subordinate in that position um in that context in that in that work situation i did my best to help all, all of my employees every single one of my crew members i wanted to <laughs> to get in touch with i wanted to know what's going on with them um i 
I I witnessed the change in this kid. Keep in mind that I'm still very young and so is this guy. But I definitely witnessed a change in this kid after he left. He was gone for about a year. He'd been to the pen. Um, I don't doubt that he was a... I, I doubt he was a stranger to, you know, some little county time. But um, he left on, on, an, on an extended stay to the pen and came back. And the difference was stark. It was uh, very visible, very, very distinguishable. It was like night and day. You could see the demeanor in his eyes. The manner in which he carried himself. Still very respectable. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I wasn't intimidated by him. I knew I knew him going in. I knew him coming out. And um, I, I knew him before he went in. I knew him. And or so I felt like I still knew him coming out. I knew the person that I had brought on and had worked with with a certain period of time. We'd been through our own little series of challenges at work and whatnot and felt like we'd forged the bond. Um, obviously, it's, I'm not going to say obviously, it, it may not be the strongest bond for some. Maybe, you know, for him, he probably gave a shit because he had bigger fish to fry, quite literally. <laughs> he had fucking, he, you know, he had more dirt to dig kind of thing. He had more dirt to shovel, more dirt to work with kind of thing. And maybe his partners, the ones that he worked with, formed a much closer, stronger than blood type of bond that I might never know because, again, I've never been part of a um, of an, an organization like that. But um, I still felt like I, I knew him. And when he came back, he was asking for a job. And in this case, I want to say it more so was the terms of his um, of his parole. He needed a uh, gainful. There you go. Gainful employment. And. And um, we gave him a shot. We gave him a shot. The difference being now that he was. Tatted. Blasted the fuck up. Had it had some very uh, identifying marks on his body, on his arms, on his face. And, um, I mean, we, we gave him a shot. We knew who, well, we knew who we had previously and that's what we were expecting. You know, ultimately there's disciplinary action and up to termination if it, if the shit goes sideways. And I, again, I doubt he would give a shit because, this guy was a street cat through and through. He knew his way around the block. He he knew how to go around the block with without breaking a sweat. You know, just cut through an alley, boom, around the block. <laughs> uh I can't I can't make too many jokes like that. Uh I'm not again, I'm not extremely well versed in in um in gang life and gang culture, but um, you know, I've, I've, I've seen some shit, I guess. I can't uh, attest to having participated in any of it, <clears throat> but I knew folks in and around it. And whenever I would interact with them, um, I, I would do my best to be a careful listener and I try to ask the right questions and facilitate I don't know if this is me being a softy. Maybe that's why they never invited me in. But I try to facilitate some kind of some kind of learning therapy where they might be able to tell me a little bit about the struggle. And in that way, I'm able to learn about it. And if I can if I can educate them on just shit that I've read, because, again, these are street cats. 
unless they've been in the pen for a, a large while or they enjoyed being scholarly since they were young. Um, a lot of them aren't extremely articulate. I'm shit, they might be expressive. And I learned how to be just as expressive. But again, there's different modes of expression between talking one-to-one personally with somebody and speaking in a professional manner. But I did my best to have... I did my best to have my air, even if it was fake, if we, even if it was a front, my air of professionalism rub off on others. I think that's what also made me a good manager. Is I, I never... I never intentionally broke face. I intention I never intentionally broke face to um to get personal with with a uh, a customer or get out of line with an employee. I I tried to remain as diplomatic as cold, as cordial and as professional as possible. Um Sorry, where was I? Well, I mean, it's a, it's about that time for a commercial break anyways. <laughs> uh, today's podcast episode is brought to you in part by... Watches. Wristwatches. Pocket watches. The clock on your phone. It's brought to you by those for keeping time. For keeping time. And it's not just so much so you know what time it is. Because you know what time it is. <laughs> See, I, I don't even sound right when I speak like that. Because I hope I've built enough of a um, of a rapport with you now. Where I'm honestly just a, um, a reformed... What is it? Reformed, not a criminal. I'm a reformed, what's the word? Because I'll, I mean, I'm still a novice. I'm still a novice at all this shit. It's entry level forever out here, if you don't already know. But keeping track of time is important. So that you know how much your time is worth and know how much your value has changed, how much, how much currency you hold in an institution. And if you need help identifying institutions, um, don't hesitate to shoot us a message on Instagram and that's at incorporating dot associates underscore i a we go by corporate cowboys you'll see us there looking very nice in a suit and tie carrying a briefcase you can also find us on patreon that's the corporate cowboys podcast It's, it's gonna have all the previous episodes on it um bonus content Possibly in the future, depending on the number of subscribers that are willing to sign up for that tier. <clears throat> and uh, where else? Where else am I? Anywhere podcasts are available. So Apple, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, um, Podbean, Anchor. And Google Play likely, more than likely, has the Corporate Cowboys podcast for you to listen to. So, with time, over time, back to the story. Back to the message, I guess. Over time and with time, I saw this this guy's change. Um... Yeah, he was a completely, completely different character, we'll say. He wasn't 
the the first couple of months there he wasn't um shit that just clicked for me too the first couple of months he was there he was not the the cheerful happy go lucky person that um just suddenly disappeared one shift the year before to be locked up um when they came back you could tell and that's when it clicked into my mind what institutionalization looks like and when he came through he definitely looked like uh, a convict he definitely looked like a prisoner um his 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 demeanor his attitude his posture how he spoke um it was all very uber formal if that makes any sense and this is when i learned um of prison code pretty much i mean you know there's there's the code of the street there's the code of there's a fucking corporate code i can get into that later on um and then there's the code of the prison that's like a, it's like a prison code and prison being an institution and if you walk out institutionalized i'm sure um folks will attest to this being true is there's just certain characteristics that you leave from prison with and walking out um your your mental capacity to think outside of prison gets challenged and you want to remain I don't say you want to remain, but it's difficult to retrain yourself to do things different outside of prison. That's that's the grip that institutionalization has on people. And I'm sure I have it. I've been institutionalized through high school, through work, through higher education, maybe little bits and pieces of institutionalization from from older friends, associates I've hung with, um, you know, the gang affiliates, me having to learn to remain respectful, to remain a professional, you know, to not have my convictions, my integrity get compromised. All that is is myself navigating and, and grappling with institutionalization. And this kid, you could tell, he, um, he, um, I don't know if he exuded a comfort because he had to now that he was out or, you know, in, in, in retrospect, he might've been fearful of of going back. He might've been fearful of losing freedom on the outside and going back in. Though he, he never claimed he was fearful. He... (laughs) Judging by the way he looked, by the way he carried himself, um, he, he told me he wasn't afraid of going back in. He was already known and he was already set up. He was part of, a, he had joined, a, yeah, the kid got really serious, man. Jeez. He, he had joined a, a fairly renowned cartel and had apparently had made a name for himself while he was in and doesn't look like he had his sentence extended or anything. So I can't speak on what those activities were. But he said that he was set up. If he ever went back, he was set for however long he was down. Uh, for however long he was sitting down, you know, however long he was in the pen. He he had said, I mean, he'd said that with, with, not with gusto, but with confidence. Like the, the kid knew what he was talking about. And um, and a, f- a few months into work, I, not a few months, maybe like a few weeks into work, I could tell that he was acclimating to being outside. Um, he still he still very much walked around with his arms with his, with his hands in front of him, kind of side to side, and uh, there were times when I would picture him in cuffs, and. Uh, that's when I could see like the effect of institutionalization, what it does to a person, how they might travel inside of a prison, 
you know, cuffed from one from one section of the prison to another. Um, that really was a trip. Even when he spoke to managers, when he spoke to customers, arms, uh, ha- arms and hands always, you know, towards the front, chest out. Um, and when I first when I first saw this, I thought it was a. Uh, I, th- I thought it was like a like a. I. <clears throat> It didn't hit me until later on when I when I saw him like walking kind of or when I saw him interacting. I forget what the particular moment was, but I had thought before like he was uh like he was posturing on people, like he was uh not squaring up because obviously he wasn't there to fight, he was there to work. But I thought like maybe it was just a way of um I don't know, like asserting dominance in a in a situation. And I thought that that's what was going on. Like it would, must have been some sort of mental game with him, or some sort of physical physical presence game with him, where if you stood with you know with your arms to the front, standing up straight, legs legs kind of ajar, like shoulder length apart. I thought it was. Um, Shit, I, I thought that looked intimidating, and I'll admit the kid, the kid gave off, uh, gave off killer vibes, man. He, <laughs> he gave off, he gave off the kind of vibes like, you you do want to associate with him, but at the same time, could you be associates kind of thing? Like that's the question that ran through my head. Like, yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess now looking back, because he was affiliated. We probably couldn't have kicked it hard, kicked it old school like we could have been able to in the past. And I'm not saying that we did, but we could have been able to. But now I knew for sure that because he was marked, um, you know, that that opportunity no longer existed. And he had, he had told me he had told me plenty of plenty of stories, plenty of war stories where I knew just hanging, hanging with him. Uh, could be constituted a felony, could constitute a felony just hanging out with him. And I I never wanted to get caught in that position when I was <clears throat> facing my own shit, pretty much. I was never of that of that caliber as as the homie. But um there was a time in my life where <clears throat> there was a time in my life where if you hung around, you might catch a case with me. And, you know, a a, a misdemeanor hardly ever a felony but for sure a misdemeanor more than likely and i've since left those days behind by the grace of a higher power and i'm i'm here to to tell to pretty much tell my story to tell speak a little bit on my experience <clears throat> but this kid you could tell and and it, it worked for him it definitely it definitely worked for it for him it worked for him in the workplace uh, he had grown maybe a hundred times more professional. I don't know what his situation was with family. I know that uh, he was making one of his own. And he was ecstatic. He was excited to be a father. Um, he was very he was very proud of, uh, of, of his accomplishments. And I, you know, I won't I can't take any recognition away from him because um, he had faced a lot of adversity and to get to that point where, you know, you're out of you're out of adolescence and you're starting to make a family your own. That's um, that's tough. That's tough for for folks living in in situations like that, surrounded with gang activity. It's difficult, especially from what I've read and what I've learned in my time, just associating with with um, quote unquote criminals. And again, I don't mean criminals in the bad sense. They're just criminals because they broke the law and they got caught. That's it. But in every other aspect, they might be good. <clears throat> um. The effect that institutionalization had on this kid 
I would say it was um, a severe change. It was it was definitely a severe change. And you could tell that there are different modes of behaving in prison. And him having come out and having been institutionalized, he had different modes of behavior that allowed him to survive in prison. And implementing those in the workplace <laughs> actually made him... And again, it, it could have been fueled by the fear of failing on parole and going back, but not nah, like I, I knew the kid before he went in. He, the kid had a heart and he was, uh, he was dedicated to, to quality work. He was, he really was dedicated to quality work. He would show up to work sometimes you know, fucked up from getting jumped or, uh, one time he had brought, brought in some contraband but, you know, I I politely told him to put that in his locker, put that shit in his locker, and let's get to work. Let's let's do his work. Let's make this money. <laughs> my score ass, my score ass, telling this kid who had a had a bag of yay and a and a piece to <laughs> to get to work and make money. I must have looked so cute, but. I don't know if uh, if that's what what caused him to to um, appreciate appreciate where I was coming from, or just the appreciate my presence that I was there. Uh, he he later went on to tell me that when he first met me, he thought I was a punk because I don't know I sound I sound soft or I sound too educated. I I don't sound streetwise. He told me he thought I was a punk, and it wasn't until he saw me handle. Um, it wasn't until he saw me handle employees and handle customers and how I how how I was able to do it coolly and calmly that he said uh, he knew I was about it, and you know that gave me a sense of pride. Why? Because he saw he saw a little bit of light in me. Um, and in essence was validating the efforts that I was putting into my, into my work because I, I definitely wanted to be, uh, a great, if not the best manager for my employees, for my crew. And, um, yeah, honestly, if, if I could, if I could see that kid again, I, you know, I would no doubt shake his hand, dap him up, give him a hug, shit, because it's been a couple years now, it's been at least, it's been at least six years since I've seen him, after the fact, I knew my ideas of institutionalization were confirmed, um, when we brought on his, uh, his former, um, maybe not his cellmates, his prison mates on to work with us had just the same work ethic. Um, they maybe weren't as dedicated to the work because, um, again, when the cartel calls, you, you answer the fucking phone. <laughs> so while one might have made it to work, another one maybe got lost, maybe was off doing something else. And um, I, I totally get it. But while we had them there, while we had them at work, they were both about the work, 100% driven and committed, wouldn't take no for an answer, always said yes to everything within reason. Very, um, very, very educated, I might say, because while they're in the pen for doing something, that got them caught up with the system in the pen there are there's other institutions other institutions of what you might consider family other institute like the cartel other institutions of what you might consider education which is politics prison politics other systems of of um other institutions of just being in order to survive and maintain in prison and 
I'm not going to say he was dumb before he went in, but when he came out, we were able to speak um, a lot more more fluidly. I want to say a lot of that has to do with with just being um, a lot more... What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Maybe he had grown less uh, less anxious about conflict, about conflict resolution, about social interaction. So the guy, he didn't look like he experienced any anxiety just talking to people, dealing with employees, dealing with guests, you know, dealing with his coworkers, dealing with guests. And I don't want to say, you know, prison life does that. Like if you shank a person, you can talk to anybody or something, if, if you know, but what it did, what it did to him, what it did for him, um, it gave him, it gave him a, an institution that it provided him the structure, the institution that he could learn to navigate and grow adept at and adapt to in order to survive. And when he came out, it more than served him in navigating another social hierarchy, which is the workplace, not just you know, prison politics, not just uh, a gang organization committing gang activity. Those principles of respect, those principles of being assertive, those principles of of dominance or submission, those principles of diplomacy, carry on and um, are inter-institutional. So it's those, it's those universal principles that more so solidified for me and I was able to confirm their existence between individuals from different walks of life and, um, and find that those who lacked them maybe had poor institutions growing up. And there were some that that while we worked, while I worked, I found had just poor resolve toward um, working within a hierarchy. I'm not going to say they bucked the system, but they were just really inept at working within a hierarchy. There was uh, some some employees, maybe their their family situation, again, wasn't complete or just wasn't at all structural wasn't edifying them and uh, they didn't know how to how to sweep a floor mop a floor wipe a table down that sort of thing and I had to teach them from scratch essentially and they were already 18 19 years old there were some other older individuals fucking in their 50s, 60s even, where I had to, uh, again, I don't know what their what their situation was. Maybe they forgot how to greet uh, a, a customer, a guest, into the, into the place, to the restaurant, or, you know, forgot how to introduce themselves. You know, maybe they felt like they were older and always required that respect going into a room, but fuck that. If you have guests, you treat them like guests kind of thing. That's just my mentality. If you have customers, the customer comes first uh, until they don't kind of thing. But whenever they would come in, this this guy, he wouldn't um, never greet anybody. He was always just quiet. And he looked, because he was older, and looked like some shit out of, um, it just looked really ominous. And just standing there waiting, waiting for the guest to say something first. <laughs> and yeah, we had to train him on how to, on how to, uh, how to be more social with the guest, how to, how to be more open, how to be more lively. So, so as to not give the restaurant a bad name. Ultimately, that's what running an organization is, is to not, is to have a good reputation and not have a bad name, not have your name soiled. But that's an episode for another day. Institutionalization, we all live it. We were born into it. 
maybe some just don't recognize that we're born into uh, a corporation, that we're born into a family, and that we owe it to one another as citizens of this corporation. We owe it to one another to to provide customer service, essentially. Guest service. I'm not going to say service one another all the time and without question, but provide um, <laughs> civil service. Provide that civil service to one another as as a civic duty, holding each other accountable to the bylaws and operating agreement to this great and beautiful corporation. Why? Because those who have been institutionalized have chosen to... um, Those who were institutionalized before chose to come over and create a new institution on themselves, create a new institution for themselves and uh, for their posterity for those individuals who would adhere to those uh, social norms, to those institutional modes. And and now that we are here, it's up to us to keep it alive. It's up to us to keep it whole. Otherwise, yeah, it falls apart. It falls apart like, (laughs) like the institution of education, like the institution of marriage, like the institution of religion. Capitalism will never die. But corporations can be dissolved. Just ask the cartel.